That's not what he said. That's not what he said! Getting accurate information from scripture is so important because if not, you can mislead people. It can actually lead people to a crisis of faith. Misleading people can cause people to not have an authentic relationship with Jesus Christ. If you're going to quote the scripture, make sure you get it right. Proverbs 22, 7 says this, train up a child in the way that he or she should go. When they get of age, they shall not, what? Part from it. Now I got a question. I done raised my son in the Lord, he died serving drugs. The scripture is a liar. So here's the thing when we tell people to read scripture, that's important, but they have to understand how to read it. Proverbs is not a book that we build doctrine on. Proverbs is a book of wisdom. It's a book that is nine out of 10 times if you do these things, it shall turn out in your favor. That's what wisdom says. Wisdom says if someone is really angry and you give them a soft answer, nine out of 10 times it will turn away wrath. Now, there are some exceptions to the rule. So Proverbs is not saying when it was written by Solomon, the wisest man on the earth, and the reason why Solomon is the wisest man on the earth, he was a king, and he asked God for, God said, give me one thing you want and I'll let you have it. He says, well, God, what I want is I want wisdom. And God says, because you didn't ask for money, because you didn't ask for a beautiful bay, I'm gonna give you everything you want and then some. Okay, so, so God, gives this book a collection of wisdom ideas to help us understand if you live your life by these principles, nine out of 10, you're gonna have a good life. Make sense? Proverbs is a book of high probability, more than likely, if you follow these truths, they're, they're not to be etched in stone to say that, you know, um, Proverbs 31 is, is, is the one that people use. Like, these are high probable things. If you look for a woman like this, you're gonna be happy. But then Proverbs ends the chapter by saying, who can find a woman like this? Y'all mad today. I got my school hat on, I'm ready for y'all. Ecclesiastes chapter number nine. Ecclesiastes chapter number nine is a verse that is oftentimes misquoted. And what I do is, is I run these sermonic things by a host of theological brains and we, 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 we fight about it until I can get to a place where I'm satisfied. And so this week, this was my text and I called several friends about it that said, I didn't even know that verse said that. Preaching for years because sometimes we hear things and we just think that's what it is and it's not what scripture says. And I had some other friends that are like, preacher, this, this is heavy. And me and my, my dear friend, Bishop John Guns, we, we sat on the phone for an hour just, and the Holy Spirit fell on that call when we talked about this passage. Because at first he was on vacation and then he said, man, I'm on vacation right now. And I said, man, I'm, I'm over here struggling, preaching the gospel for Jesus Christ with the saints of God and you on vacation. And I said, I, I wanna read you a text. And he says, why in the world would you wanna preach this during a pandemic? And I said, the reality of, the, the reality of, of life is this. People are struggling to believe in God because what they think about him is not what he said about himself. So my job is to correct bad teaching. You don't correct bad teaching with not teaching about it. You correct bad teaching with right teaching. Okay, so Ecclesiastes chapter number nine, verse 11. I'm gonna read this out of the NLT version. Um, First, I'm going to read it out of the ESV version, and I like the ESV version because it's the closest translation to the original text is the ESV. Most would agree to that, okay? Um, so the English uh, ESV says this. Let me see where it is. Okay, 
again, I, Ecclesiastes 9, verse 11. That's the only verse we're going to be at, so you might as well look at it. Uh, Ecclesiastes is, is after Proverbs. You know, there's a whole bunch of books. Y'all ever read Songs of Solomon? Anybody? Who hasn't read it? Just don't, be, don't lie. It's okay. Who's married and hasn't read it? Read it tonight with your spouse. Just as devotion. <laughs> All right. Praise God. Fifty Shades of Grey ain't got nothing on it. I've observed something else under the sun. The fastest runner doesn't always win the race, and the strongest warrior doesn't always win the battle. The wise sometimes go hungry. The skillful are not necessarily wealthy, and those who are educated don't always lead successful lives. It is all decided by chance, being in the right place at the right time. That's a New Living Translation. Uh, the ESV says this way. Again, I saw that under the sun, the race is not to the swift, nor the battle to the strong. And most of us have heard that verse end this way. But he that endures till the what? That's not what the verse says. The race is not given to the swift or the strong. The battle, the, the, the race is not given to the swift, nor the battle to the strong, but he that can endure. That's nowhere in there. It says, again, I saw under the sun, the race is not to the swift, nor the battle to the strong, nor bread to the wise, nor riches to the intelligent, nor favor to those with knowledge, but time and chance happen to us all. This is going to help you. So in the Jewish complete version, it says this, yet another thing I've observed in the sun is that races are won, are, aren't won by the swift or battles by the strong or food doesn't go to the wise or wealth to the intelligent or favor to experts. Rather, time and chance rule us all. NLT says it. I'm going to read it one more time because we've got to get it in our hearts. I have observed something else under the sun. The fastest runner doesn't always win the race. The strongest warrior doesn't always win the battle. The wise sometimes go hungry, and the skillful aren't necessarily wealthy. And those who are educated don't always lead successful lives. It is all decided by chance, by being in the right place at the right time. All right, here we go. Let's do some work, church. It's going to be a little work, so you might want to have your pen and paper handy. Let me start with my intro because that's my real scholastic part. Let me put my glasses on because it makes you look like you did some work. <laughs> put it on, right? It is widely accepted that Solomon, the wisest man ever, wrote Ecclesiastes, though some disagree. Some believe it was written by someone else who gathered all of Solomon's thinking. Nonetheless, it was written directly or indirectly by Solomon. He's credited with writing Proverbs, Songs of Solomon, all married couples need to read that tonight, and Ecclesiastes. This morning, I want to dive into something not often proclaimed, but very true. We often hear the race is not given to the swift, nor the battle to the strong, but he that can endure. This is not how the verse goes. The reason for this series is to peel back the building blocks we have declared as God's word, but have been altered by culture. I feel this generation slash culture has interpreted scripture without the scripture. My training in learning scripture comes from two liberal schools and two conservative schools of theology. This has helped me find the middle, in my opinion. Let me attack one common misapplication, which was the Proverbs 22, 6, train up a child in the way that we should go. This, this morning, I will stick with this one passage and realize Scripture does clearly say, very clearly in Matthew 5, 45, God reigns on the just and the unjust. Right? Matthew 5, 45. Let us explore reality that the opposite can happen in life. One thing for sure is if we explore Scripture, we, as one thing is for sure, as we explore Scripture, one thing we all need to realize, we will never still fully understand God. 
Neither is God obligated to report to us every decision that he makes. You may be sitting there saying, well, man, how in the world does this work? Deuteronomy 29, 29 is one of my favorite verses. It says, the secret things of the Lord belong to the Lord thy God, which means just as you as a parent don't tell all your children everything, God as a parent doesn't always tell us his children everything. This lesson will help you trust God, but also leave room for life to be life. Or as the verse says, time and chance happen to us all. We can safely draw the conclusion from a book that Paul writes that it's about doctrine. We can tell from the book of Exodus that God has given us a book of history of how he is bringing us from slavery into the promised land. But what's recorded in Ecclesiastes in, 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 in Ecclesiastes and Proverbs is Solomon's reasoning. So how then will we interpret this part of the Bible? We utilize, we recognize it's a report of human reasoning given, given the authority through scripture to help us live valiant lives. This book communicates Solomon's wisdom, not what God reveals about doctrine. So let's get into this. Have you ever wondered how come some people are so smart but they're not living a good life? This scripture is pretty clear. It says this, I have observed something under the sun. The fastest runner doesn't always win the race. Have you ever watched a race and you're like, man, I'm sure this person's gonna win. And then all of a sudden they don't win and you're like, what in the world happened? This just lets us know that just because you think you're a guarantee doesn't mean you are a guarantee. Because life can happen to all of us and life will happen to all of us. It, it, then it says this, it says this, the strongest warrior doesn't always win the battle. You remember in, in Gideon where God says, hey man, you got too many people. I, I, want you to, I want you to only have 300, but God, how am I gonna fight all these people with 300 people? He says, no, nah, these 300 are gonna cause you to win, which is very unique because sometimes we think we need more to win and God's trying to train us that sometimes more is not better, sometimes less is better. So here it is. Then it says, the wise sometimes go hungry. Some of the smartest people I know, finances don't match their wisdom. Because you could be wise and know how to give great insight to others, but not know how to do it yourself. Okay, come in church. Do you know 51% of marriage, marriage therapists are divorced? Just because you're wise doesn't mean you know how to take the medicine for yourself. You ever have a doctor who's overweight telling you you need to get healthy? Like, what do you, what do you mean? Like, I mean, come on, how does this conversation work? So this is what it says. The wise don't always mean that they know it themselves. They may teach, they may have great social media quotes, but that doesn't mean their quotes work for them. Some of the people that we think, oh, oh, what they call them, um, um, uh, like husband goals or what they call them, marriage goals or, or, or power couples. Like they may be a power couple in what they give, but not be a power couple in how they live. This is what Ecclesiastes tells us, that the wise don't always have, the wise sometimes go hungry, and it says the skillful are not necessarily wealthy. Some people who are the most skilled are not making what they should because although they're skilled, they have insecurities about their skill. And their insecurity causes them not to move out on things that God called them to because they always second guess why God called them and God has to spend the entire days convincing them that he called them and then after a while God just finds someone else who will just say yes. The greatest speakers don't have the biggest churches. So this, this, this helps us put into framework what the reality of life is. And it says just because you're educated doesn't mean you lead a successful life. 
So we harp on our children. You need to get an education, and that is true. You need to get a degree. And if you're from a Caribbean household, you need to be either a nurse, doctor, or a lawyer. If you're not doing any of that, you're not doing a good job with your life. But the reality is, is that you could have a profession and still not have a life. Ecclesiastes balances it and says, hey, listen, a plumber could be doing better than those with a PhD behind their name. You and student loans and the electrician came out of school without the, without the debt and is doing far more. Scripture is balancing life because life is like a scale. It will eventually balance itself. There was one person who says it this way. What's up, Keith? There was one person who says it this way. It says, life is fair. Eventually, it'll break all of our hearts. If you live long enough, life will break all of our hearts. Whether it be a child. You know, back in the old day, back in the old saints, they used to gossip in a way of prayer. They used to call, I'm not trying to gossip. But did you hear such and such daughter got pregnant? No, I'm not trying to gossip because I want to pray and we're going to pray for But And then there was a very famous thing that you say, well, be careful what you say because your child is still growing up. Right? Life has a way of balancing itself in a way that doesn't make sense. And then here's, here's how this, this, this one makes it beautiful. It says, it, it's decided by... In the, in the ESV, time and chance happen to us all, which simply means this, that no matter how well you structure your world, tragedy can hit any of us. How do you get on a plane, Kobe Bryant, and out of, you got all the money in the world. You got all the resources that any man could think of. Out of all people, it happened to you, which simply lets us know, time and chance happen to us all. There's no one exempt from tragedy. So here's the thing. When you were born into sin, shaping an iniquity in this world, God simply said, anything is liable to happen in the earth realm because this is not heaven. And I know we want to make it heaven. And I know we want to make this and this and that, but that's not the reality. Time and chance happen to us all. You could be a benefactor of time and chance, or you could be the recipient of something negative because of time and chance. Bro, we were just playing basketball on the basketball court, and they just happened to do a drive-by shooting, and my, I, was, I happened to be there, and I got shot. In, time and chance. It's not that God is angry and God is mean, and, and we oftentimes are mad because we want God to stop everything. Well, let's, let's be rational, people. Do you stop everything for your own children? Because if you were to stop everything for your children, they would not grow. They would not learn how to live properly. Some stuff you got to let them experience so they can live. You got to remember, time to God is not what it is to us. First Peter says, a day to the Lord is like a thousand years. A thousand years is like a day to the Lord. So you're saying, God, I've been in this all day long. God is saying, I've been here since eternity, and it feels like a second. So this light affliction doesn't compare to the future glory that we shall experience. Time and chance happen to us all. So let me, let, me get, let me get to my notes so I can go through and, and make sure. So, so some things he, he talks about. The wise. Your wisdom means nothing without God's wisdom. And your wisdom means nothing unless God puts you in the right place at the right time. Because some of you didn't get the right job because you didn't meet the right person to give you the right opportunity to give you the right interview. So, okay, let me give you an example. Um, so, you, you know about the housing project we're building. Y'all, some of you don't know the story behind it. It sounds good on Instagram. It looks really good when you put 59 homes, people clap and all that type of stuff. But the story behind it is a God story. I, I sell commercial property, which most of you know. Um, so, 
And I, I keep saying that because people need to know because they like to count your pockets. So I want to say that. So this is the thing. I was selling a, a church on Powers Drive, the, the old um, New Destiny church. And they got a new pastor and, a, and they called me the same day and said, hey, we want to not sell our church anymore. I cried. That was a lot of money lost. It's like 3% of $2 million is a lot of money. It is a lot of money, right? So I said to myself, I said, when do you want the sign removed? We want it moved today. Well, that's kind of insensitive. You just called me at 2 o'clock. So they said, well, either you take it down or we're going to be, we're going to take it down ourselves. So we were trying to sell our land on Powers Drive and could never get it sold. We fired the listing company that was trying to sell it for our church. We said, no, we're not going to let you sell it anymore. So I had no choice but to move the sign. I didn't know where to move it. But then I realized, hey, there's a land the church owns up the street. Let me just park this sign there until I figure out where I want to put it. Well, a group, a Brazilian group decided that they were going to drive from Lee Road. They took Lee Road and then they ended up going down Clark Konokoe. They were trying to get to Dr. Phillips. And instead of going down Hiawassee, they went down Powers. When they went down Powers, they saw a sign. They said, we've never seen this sign before. They called me and said, where is this property listed because we don't see it anywhere. I said, actually, it's not listed. Just fired the guy. I just put the sign out there just to get it off of another piece's property. And they said, well, we're trying to build houses. Well, we're looking for someone to help us build homes. And then all of a sudden they said, well, let's talk. So I said, this is what we want for the land. They said, okay, let's see what we can work out. Then we meet with them, and I'm sitting there talking to the guy, and I, I did all my research on the company and found out that the guy's kids does karate in, in Winter Garden. And, and I said, whoa, man, wow, okay, I see you do stuff in Winter Garden. I, I live around the area. He said, where do you live? And I was like, well, I live around the area because you don't tell people where you live if you don't know who they are. And he says, oh, well, I live in Winter Garden too. And then, you know, we're playing this little dance. Tell me a little bit, I'll tell you a little bit. Come to realize he lives in my neighborhood. So this man happened to be driving down Clark Konokoe Road, wasn't intending to go down Powers Drive, happened to go down Powers Drive, ended up going down Powers Drive. I happened to take my sign up, and all of this may seem like coincidence. There is no coincidence in Scripture. It's all divine. It's all time and the Lord's chance coming together. So sometimes our prayer needs to be, like it says in this passage, it says this, it says, God, help me be at the right place at the right time. You do know how Bishop T.D. Jakes got discovered. A man saw him preaching, said, you're a really good preacher, so I'm going to put you on my TV show. Puts him on his TV show at the time, the largest owner of Christian television, Paul and Jan Crouch were alive. They just so happened to be strolling by their TV. They see this bald-headed guy preaching, or he had a little afro at the time. And they were mesmerized and they said, whoever this guy is, we need to make sure that we get to know him. And from that simple opportunity, his life changed overnight. Time and chance. Now that could be negative too. You could just be driving, crossing the street. Car comes super fast and hits you. Time and chance. So here, let me, let me move, let me move, let me move, let me move. This talks about athletics, military service. That's why you can't get so confident that you'll win every fight because you're not guaranteed to win every fight. How many of you in school and you, and you saw a big bully get beat up by someone least likely? Why right? he was like, what just happened? Like, wow, because it can happen to anybody. What the scriptures is telling us, don't get so, don't lean so much on your own ability that you think you're always going to win. There may be seasons where you lose because life is going to balance itself out. So here, are, there are two factors that are beyond human control. There are time and chance. So here's what you need to know. When you hear the word chance, it's not talking about luck because in their culture, let me say it this way, in their culture, viewing something as random happening was not considered fate. 
time and chance are presented here not as two separate contingencies but as a single factor. A well-timed coincidence can occur in any situation and alter what would have been considered an assured outcome. You ever watch a football game? And you sure your team's gonna win. Let's go back a couple years when LeBron James was gonna win a championship and Kyrie Irving's knee goes out. And everybody knew it's over. Because time and chance happen to us all. Don't get mad at God because life happens. I don't know how it all works out in God's eternal wisdom. I don't know how a basketball player loses his life on a plane and a criminal that kills multiple children is still alive flying throughout the world. These are the real questions that you ask that sometimes we need to stop and say, you know what? I need to stop trying to be God. Because if you try to be God too long, you'll talk yourself out of a relationship with God. So here's what it is. Number one, the smartest doesn't give. So this is, this is very important. If the fastest doesn't win the race, if the strongest warrior doesn't always win the battle, if the wise sometimes go hungry, this means that it should give hope to the weak that even if you feel like you're weak, you still have a chance at this thing called life. Because some of you discount yourself and say, well, I'm not finna do that because they're, they're, you know, they're strong, that's why they're able to do all that. They're, they're big, that's why they're able to do all that. No, God's simply saying this, just because they're predicted to win doesn't mean they always win. If you step up and show up, I may favor you more than them, and you may end up winning bigger than they could ever win. So it is, number, number one, the smartest doesn't always get the best outcome. Number three is bad fortune can happen to anybody but good fortune can happen to anybody too. Why shouldn't you start the business? Who knows? God may prosper you and a millionaire come and find you. You're so scared because you think, well, I'm not, I do paintings, but I'm not as good as such such. You don't know who God can send to like you. You don't know who God can send to favor you. Maybe God told you to go back to school and be a mental health counselor. And you're sitting there saying, well, I don't know about that. There's so many people. Number one, you should know you got great job security because COVID's making people even more crazy. So God is calling you to that field. And you don't know who God can send you to change your life. Because time and chance can happen to us all. You cannot rely on your wisdom because your wisdom can only take you so far. God can override what you know and give you someone who knows more more than you to help you get to your expected end. So here it is. Let me give you this story because I think it's helpful. So me and John were having this conversation and I thought this was beautiful. This was the most beautiful conversation and, and, and he left this conversation saying the same thing. We started talking about mamas, because I started talking about my sermon last week, and he started talking about his mama. <clears throat> and um, so we, we were trying to frame how does time and chance make sense. And I said last week, if you didn't watch the sermon, that you understand life in reverse. You don't understand a season until you come out of it. Some of my most painful experiences pastoring were, if I could get rid of them, I would say I don't want to get rid of them because they made me better. Now, in the, in, when it happened, it didn't make me better. It, it definitely didn't make me feel that way. There were times where I felt like, I probably shouldn't say that, but there were, there were times, 
<laughs> there, there were times where I thought I was going to end up on the news for just responding to people in such a way that would destroy their future, or their hope of building anything good or anything. Because I'm pretty good with comebacks. Like, if you try me, I could, I could either lean on the Holy Spirit and give you a comeback that will kind of make you feel bad, but then if I really want to get in the flesh, I can give you a comeback that's so bad, you'll be 50 years old still thinking about what I said to you at 12. So, I, but there were times where I really wanted to use that side, and the Holy Spirit was like, no, 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 you need these lessons because they're going to help develop you in a season that you don't yet, in a season that you have not yet been introduced to. So this is a good story. So we're talking about his mom. And his mom was a prayer warrior like my mom. And his mom ended up getting cancer. Very painful type cancer. To where you just basically shrivel up and die. His mama was a preacher. She always preaching to people. And a lady came to her and said, how in the world could you be serving God and God allow this to happen to you? Because people are nasty. They'll, they'll, they'll drive that God in your face when, it's, when, you, when life is at its worst. Right? So John was very upset. It, at a point, it really hurt him because he could not reconcile, God, there's a lot of people you could give cancer to. Number one, that's a flawed theology because if you think God gives cancer, then you look at God as a criminal. That what loving father goes around handing out cancer? Do you see how bad that sounds when we start praying, God, I, I, we know you gave it and you can take it away. Well, wait a minute. If God is given cancer, what type of God is he? Sin builds sickness with it. And in our country, greed makes people get sick. Because greed makes them say, we don't want to get you well because we need you as a patient. You know, when you go to a hospital, I love hospitals, nurses, but the intent is to make you better. It's not to make you whole. Only God can make you whole. Only God will keep you off of those things. You won't be going to prescription after prescription after prescription after prescription. So we started saying, well, he said, his mama said, well, it just happened to be my lot that I ended up getting cancer. And God saw it was going to land on me and allowed it. I don't know why he allowed it. That's the question that you will have to ask God when you face him. You will never get an answer in the earth. And if you're not okay with it, your faith will never grow. When my wife and I first got married, we, we experienced a foreclosure. Then you get seven years, your credit's all jacked up. I married my wife, she had great credit. I took it for a nosedive to see if it was real. <laughs> and I was just like, man, it was such a failure. You took your wife's credit and you tanked it. And... But we learned. We learned what not to do. We thought that if we hired the best agent in the city, they would be able to get our home sold, which wasn't true. Because we hired the best agent, but because our case wasn't big enough to him, that he didn't put his effort into it. So, which simply tells us, just because you're not the best agent doesn't mean you can't do the best work. So here's what John and I saw. I tell you, he said, well, his mama ended up telling John, John, I know God now like I've never known him on her cancer bed. She said, God has taught me so much. John, I want to tell you there was a season in my life I had a dark side in my life that you never knew about. But this cancer brought the dark side to light. Because remember, God can't heal what you hide. So, so all of a sudden, now his, her relationship, she says, my relationship with God is so much better than when I was whole. Now, here's the thing. We understand life in reverse. His mama dies. 
and I want to speak to this very clearly if you haven't been here, your parents will die. And the reality is, is you may say, well, God, I want you to keep her alive. If God keeps her alive, how long is he going to keep her alive? Let's, let's, because this is a real thinking series. How long is he going to keep her alive? Well, God, keep her alive for another 10 years. When the 10 years runs out, then what? So at some point, we got to rationalize and concretize within ourselves, this is every man's reality. That it is appointed unto man once to die. And after this, the judgment. Hebrews 9, 27. So his mama dies. She has a funeral. Her funeral had over 2,000 people in it. It was standing room only, and they had to turn people away because there were so many people at her funeral. And here's what John said. He said, what we learned was that till this day, people still talk to him about his mama's faith. And this was such a powerful phrase that we both stopped on the phone and said, this is God. He said, her life outlasted her sickness. What he realized was in her death, her life lived far longer because of her sickness. Her sickness was a season, but because of the way she carried herself, her life far outlived her sickness. God has a way of taking and making all things work together for the good of those who love him and are called according to his purpose. Now, butter doesn't taste good by itself, but it's part of the ingredients to make a good cake. Eggs don't taste good by itself, but it's part of the ingredients to making a good cake. Sugar by itself will make you sick but it's part of the ingredients of making a good cake. Flour will make you sick if you eat it by itself. But when the chef gets together and identifies all of the ingredients necessary and begins to mix them together, what once started as individually disgusting to you, but when mixed together, you get a finished product that is good for you. And what may not be good to you in one season will be good for you in another season. You just got to trust that God will make it work together. And listen, y'all, I don't know how God is going to make it work together. But keep on living. He's going to make it work together for your good. Can I give you another story and I'm going home? Even when we were trying to acquire this church, I went to the place that I knew had my best interests at heart. We've given them millions of dollars. I knew for sure I can depend on this place. And when I showed them my dreams, they kind of laughed at it. But God needed that to happen. Because sometimes we can build allegiances to individuals and we replace God out of the equation. And you sit there and you wonder to yourself, like, well, listen, and I see some of you tearing up and you're just trying to figure this thing out like all of us. And you sit there trying to figure out, how's this gonna work for my good? You're mad, you're angry, you're upset, because you're like, time and chance happens to us all, but this chance feels really bad. Out of all people, God, I've been serving you my whole life. We do the whole integrity thing with God to try to barter with God on why he should do something favorable for us. 
God, I'm talking too long, it's 1148. And so all of a sudden, God moved us to a bank we never even known. I passed by this bank every day on my way home and never thought twice about it. I happened to call a friend and tell him the story, and then he said to me, he said, well, I got a friend that may be able to help you. I start talking to the bank, and we, the bank, she ends up doing the loan for us, but here's the crazier part. When she started doing a loan for us, I started talking to my real estate broker about this lady. And my broker said, I know her. She's best friends with one of the staff that works in our company. So I called her, I said, hey, did you know this person? She said, oh yeah, that's my best friend. So while you were upset about one season, God was connecting the dots on another season because he knew that season was only going to take you so far. You need another connection that can go with where you're trying to go. And you need to embrace what I'm going to do for you. And though you cried in one season, though you were mad in another season, though you did not eat in another season, now you're talking about putting lights in a building that you thought you could never have, you thought you could never own, you thought you could never acquire. Why? Because God will make it work together for you. I don't know how it's, you need to talk to somebody. Don't touch them. Just, just encourage them and wave your hand at them online or in the building and let them know. I don't know how it's going to work out. I, I get it. I don't know how God's going to do it. I don't know why you lost your scholarship, but I do know one thing. If you trust in the Lord with all your heart and lean not into your own understanding, but in all your ways, you acknowledge him. He is faithful to direct Direct your path. He's your God in the middle of the pandemic. He's your God in the middle of closed doors and open doors. You just got to know that God knows better than I know for myself. I don't know how he's going to do it. I don't understand how it's going to work. I don't even see it working. But one thing I know is that God will make it work together for them that love him. Just make sure you don't stop loving him and he'll make sure sure it works for your good. By your heads, let's pray. Oh, y'all, let me, Kenise, give me this. I want y'all to screenshot this. This is, this is what I want you to see. So this is what it means. Time and chance means this. Under the right circumstances, the most unlikely or improbable can happen to anyone. That's all it means. Time and chance means under the right conditions, the most unlikely or improbable can happen to anyone. God can reign on the just and the unjust. Right? So if you're here and you're in the sanctuary, listen, this is, this is introspective. And you may be online and you may say, I need to really connect with Jesus. If that's you, all you got to do is type the word Jesus. We're going to connect with text. Text the word Jesus to 407-449-8884. 407-449-8884. Text the word Jesus to 407-449-8884. We will follow up with you. We will invite you to our faith talk, which is the way you can break the word down each and every day to help you grow spiritually. But this is real introspectively. I've been accused of it as well and have been wronged by it. Sometimes you get the short end of the stick and you can think God has failed you. And you, we, really need to, we really need to just take a moment and just ask God to give us the wisdom to trust him even when it doesn't make sense. Man, I mean, in the past, I'd have lost eight people in a short span of time. I, I can't make sense of it. I'm not trying to. Time and chance happen to them all. That may not be sufficient for you, but that is the reality of life. But you, 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 need, to, you, need, to, you need to get peace. You, you need to pray that, God, I pray you give me peace that I don't always have to know why.
You know, you're, you're, you're I, man, why my dad wasn't there? Why, why my dad didn't raise me? Maybe God, I don't know. Maybe God knew your dad was going to be so detrimental to your future that he removed him from being there. And that might sound crazy and harsh, but maybe God knew that he was not going to be a benefit to your destiny. I don't know. I don't know. And that's okay. I want to give you permission in your faith to say, I don't know. Faith isn't about knowing everything. It's about trusting when you don't know. Father, if there's a sinner in this sanctuary that hasn't made peace with you, would you invite their hearts to make peace with you now? If you're here and you're like, man, PD, PD, I, I don't, I don't, I don't, hold on. I don't, I don't know. I don't know where I am with God. But I, I, I know this message really made me believe like some of the things that I'm really internally mad at God at, it's not his fault. Like, I signed up to follow God, and then I started getting persecuted, but I didn't really know that Matthew 5, 12 told me that rejoice and be exceedingly glad when persecution comes upon you. Like, they didn't tell me that in church. And I know I should be reading my Bible, but I don't always read it, and I felt like I got played. If that's you, I just want you to wave your hand. I'm not going to put a mic to your face. I just want to pray with you. Like, I've come to realize that, you know, listen, maybe it's just been time and chance that's happened to me. It was my lot that was dealt. I see your hands. I see them. Your hands is not an acknowledgement that you don't trust God. Your hands are acknowledgement that you are Job, you're feeble in your body. And sometimes your faith is not long enough to trust them through the entire duration. Thank you, Lord, for letting us have a space where we can be honest and open with you and say, God, I don't know why. But God, just as you allow fortunate things to happen for others, sometimes negativity happens because we are built into this world of sin. And we will never be at home in this place because we are pilgrims. We're not designed to live here. We're passing through. This is the land of the dying. We are trying to get to the land of the living. So Jesus, I pray for that believer that's putting their confidence in you today. And everybody repeating with me, this prayer is not a prayer that just, it's an acknowledgement of faith. And you may be saying, I said this prayer and I don't feel like things changed in my life. I want you to give God one day at a time. Read Proverbs each and every day. It's a source of wisdom. It's a good book to live by. It's a, it will help you be moral, ethical. Christianity is not about behavior modification. It's about inviting the Holy Spirit in to lead you and to guide you. There will be behavior and moral modification when the Holy Spirit sanctifies you. Yes. Let's pray all together. Repeat with me, even if you have a mask on and even you who snuck your mask slightly off. Say, Father, I come to you as a human being, sometimes confused, needing answers, Come on, church. Needing clarity. I ask of you, God, to help me learn to trust you even when I can't trust anything around me. Father, I ask you to send me the help of the Holy Spirit. Holy Spirit, Yes, lead me, guide me, help me walk into all truth. Father, I promise, I promise, I promise to try my best to hold on to the hymn 
of your garment even when I don't understand. Thank you, Lord, for letting me hear this word. It was the right time. It was the right word for the season of my life. I thank you. I thank you in Jesus' name. Come on, clap it up and receive. This series is so important. That's not what he said. It helps us fall in love with Jesus actually says and what scripture actually says. So we don't build a relationship with a Jesus that we have created in our mind that's not in the scripture. That's not what he said.